This episode of RTN Theology is dedicated to and in memory of the Reverend Mike Boone. Mike was one of Chris Breslin's dearest friends. He died suddenly this week. One of Chris's last texts to Mike just days ago was about how excited Chris was for him to hear this conversation between Scott and Mako. Mike was a fierce friend, courageous and caring pastor, master barbecuer, lover of Sounders soccer, Seminoles football, and Durham Bulls baseball. Above all, he loved Jesus, the church, and people. He was never shy with a theology take or a hold steady song recommendation, and was the sort of thoughtful, creative, and kind Southerner many of us in the South should aspire to be like. Chris told me earlier today that he hasn't begun to feel all the ways that he'll miss Mike. But Mike, as you share in Christ's presence with all the saints, pray for us, bud. Billy Ark out of Gopher Wood, the flood it came and the Ark it stood. And those Arks are moving and moving and moving, and those Arks are moving and moving along. Who built the Ark? Oh, no, and no. Now who built the Ark? Oh, no, and my Lord. And those Arks are moving and moving and moving, and those Arks are moving and moving along. March the animals two by two, the hippopotamus and the kangaroo. And those larks are moving and moving and moving, and those larks are moving and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh, no, no. Now who built the ark? Oh, no, my lord. No larks are moving and moving and moving, and those larks are moving and moving along. I'm Bob Crawford. And I'm Chris Breslin. And this is RTN Theology number 27. And, um,. You know, uh, several months ago, we began to deem these Theology Thursdays, like we post these episodes on Thursdays, and, um, you know, we've had some great guests. There's just no doubt about it. We've had some very well-curated episodes, and I think the idea through the pandemic of bringing people in conversation is a way for us to come together when we can't be together. And so this episode, Chris and I were so thrilled to welcome Mako Fujimura and Scott Avitt, two all-inspiring visual artists, and I'd say examples of artist as human being. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I I first got to know Mako when he came to Durham and Duke for a Dita project painting for the, for T.S. Eliot's four quartets and um, have followed him since and just really admire the kind of hope that permeates his work. And, And also like when he comes to Duke, he normally speaks at the Divinity School to people of faith, but he also leads workshops in the art department. So he's a world-class artist, world-class theologian, uh, coming out with an awesome book. Maybe we'll have him back next year when his book comes out. Uh, It's going to be a major um, uh, piece for people concerned with theology and art. Um, And, and of course, have been a fan of of your band and Scott for for so long. So it it was a real pleasure to get to put them together and also just just hear where they're at in this strange time Um, while everyone is is mourning, but also everyone's still creating. I I thought that was so cool um, to to hear from both of them on that. You hear this week we're approaching, uh, I mean, by the time this airs, we'll probably have 100,000 confirmed COVID deaths, probably several, several more beyond that. And, um, the idea of how do we mourn collectively as a society, um, as a nation, um, is really permeated my mind over the past, uh, several weeks and Scott and Mako, um, kind of help us work through that. And that's very important. You know, speaking of theology and art, Chris, we've had David Taylor, We've had Cutter Calloway in some ways. Uh, I would, Jeremy Begbie. Yeah. Jeremy Begbie, absolutely, who I've gone back and I've begun to read his books again uh, the, just, just this week. Uh, trying to think about how, you know, he so eloquently uh, describes the piano and the actual, the chords, these, these tr- we think of them as triads, um, but how they 
seem to reflect uh, the triune God uh, and the relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I've been thinking about the base. How does the base fit in there? How do, how how is the base an element of worship? Not just the base, but other instruments. But this idea, this um, this theme, this uh, this this line of academia, if you want, this line of theology of theology and the arts. Uh, really excited to continue to walk down this road with you, Chris. And thank you so much uh, for being a part of this show. And and again, um, this is a conversation I know you and I were both thrilled to have. It was a blast to be a part of it and hope that it's a blessing to y'all. I wrote the book Culture Care. It was a compilation of many lectures that I gave uh, after 9-11, after 2001. Um, I had to think through what it means to be an artist in, in a time of uh, trial, time of crisis. And it occurred to me that a lot of the churches, a lot of the even uh, my friends who are artists, uh, a, lot of, a lot of Christians on one hand, a lot of artists on the other hand, uh, you know, fighting for their territorial rights um, and culture wars uh, have become the normative way that we have public discourse about culture. And um, I had a privilege of working with poet and uh, executive Dana Joya, who was the chair of National Endowment for the Arts between 2003 and 2010, I believe he he was there. And, uh, you know, I was appointed to be on the National Council on the Arts uh, by President Bush to help him as a citizen to think through uh, our culture and why do we need advocacy for the arts in, in a time when people are um, struggling to survive and so forth. Um, and it, it occurred to me that the very premise of preserving whatever the territory, ideological territory on, doesn't help to feed anybody. In fact, in fact, you're shooting yourself in the foot uh, by doing that. And I saw that literally in front of me as, you know, people bickered over the funding of National Endowment or, or the arts in general. So as I went around the country and including internationals, I was sent to some very important public meetings. One was with um, First Lady Laura Bush to Paris to represent U.S. in UNESCO re-entrance or what was or what became a um, a way to gauge um, you know arts advocacy in the world. Um, I began to write down some of these thoughts, and, and sometimes I would be lecturing in uh, public arenas about the arts, why why American arts is important for America <laughs> as well as in the world. And I, uh, as I thought about that, I, I, uh, as I wrote these things down, and behind every lecture were some theological thoughts that I've, I've had held over the years and, and nurtured over the years. Uh, but I, you know, this is a public discourse. So I'm not going to mention Galatians 5 in my talk. But it, it became very evident to me that what I was actually doing was not just defending the arts, but defending the gospel uh, perspective of Jesus 
really changing how we view everything, including religion, uh, to see it from the world uh, assumption of abundance uh, of creation and invoking the new creation into our scarcity filled lives. And as I as we're writing these things down, my friend who is an editor suggested that I write a book on cultural care. Um, so it, it, he, uh, he has a lot to do with the term culture care. He said, that's what you're doing. You're, you're doing culture care instead of culture wars, fighting culture wars. And I thought that was a pretty good way of looking at this. Um, yes, I do see culture not as a territory to be fought over, um, decimating the very place that we're, we're standing on. Um, but culture is is a, a ecosystem to steward. It's it's a garden to tend to, and no matter what your ideology, we have a responsibility to the next generation. Just like natural resources that we need to steward um, to pass it down, uh, cultural landscape is something to take care of and pass it on to the next generation, hopefully in better shape than we received that. Um, and I, when I thought about that, and when I thought about the um, detrimental effects of culture wars, I realized, you know, when you, when you look at our lives and our culture, uh, and you ask this very simple question, you know, where is the fruit of the spirit in culture? Right, so the fruit of the spirit defined in Galatians 5 by Paul is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self control. Right, you ask anybody out there, okay, even the hardened um, atheists, you know, where. Where are we? How are we doing <laughs> in culture? Do we have love? Do we have joy? Do we have peace? And, and the answer is kind of obvious, right? We, we, we look at ourselves, even in a church, and we talk about culture as, as a limited resource environment that we have to fight over. And therefore, instead of love, we, we have to hate people. Instead of joy, you know, we, we have anxiety. Instead of peace, you know, we, we fight culture wars. So we're not doing that well, you know. And um, if you ask a non-Christian, let's say an artist in Chelsea that has wrestled against the church all her life, you know, how are we doing? Um, and she may say the same thing. Uh, no, we're not doing well. So, you know, both sides agree on this. So uh, how can we have a public dialogue toward common uh, ground that allows us to talk about culture in, with different language? You know, uh, I think it was Joseph Campbell who said, you know, if you want to change the world, change the metaphor. So what if we change the metaphor from culture wars to culture care? What kind of conversations will we have? And surely, uh, you know, this can be tested in a hardened, uh, poisoned ground of Washington, D.C. Uh, at the height of cultural wars to see if this actually makes practical sense. And what Dana Joya did between 2003, um, when he came in, it was at the height of cultural wars, it still is going on, but, but at, at that time, people definitely thought that we should eliminate National Endowment, all the public funding for the arts, blah, 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 the conservatives are, you know, ramping up their uh, discourse and uh, told Dana Joya, when he came in to uh, be appointed to the chair of National Endowment, one senator said to him that you are being appointed as the sacrificial lamb to the altar of cultural wars. We're going to shut down the agencies. Uh, this is a waste of money. This is extravagance we can't afford in time of war. And, um, you know, you're going to help us do it. And what did Dana do? He did the opposite. He, uh, in fact, at the end of his tenure, uh, he had expanded uh, the NEA uh, to the uh, largest block of um, funding available to especially local districts that did not have arts education anymore. We had everything from Shakespeare in America programs to Operation Homecoming to returning soldiers, um, uh, Poetry Out Loud, which is uh, well, at one point was um, uh, broadcast on ESPN of high school students 
reciting poetry in incredible ways. Um, we expanded the program to Big Read, where regions were reading uh, one book, uh, high school to uh, local uh, community centers. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird was our first book. And um, it, it, you know, we found out that culture care indeed works. We bring together people, communities, all of the conservative centers that were set to eliminate the agency realized that we need the arts for their constituencies. Because without the arts, we don't have a way to bring people together, for them to have a platform to even say what they have done in Washington, D.C. It's impossible if you have been just riding on one side of the aisle. And it's increasingly polarized. And what you know, what's happening now in Washington continues to be a um, result of many years of fighting culture wars. Um, and uh, so, you know, culture care is not a war against culture wars. Um, there are certain issues I'm sure all of us have that is worth defending and fighting for. But uh, as a metaphor, culture wars does not work. It, it, it just simply decimates the very territory that you are standing on. Therefore, by demonizing the other side, you end up defeating yourself, shrinking your own territory. And that's what's been happening in culture and increasingly this acrimonious you know, fear and anxiety has only increased. So for Christian church, you know, what does that mean? Well, that, that means we have a uh, opportunity and responsibility to lead uh, in a world which Jesus warned us would not, you know, May anything near uh, the fruit that the Spirit can give us in culture. So we need to reestablish that as cultural norms of the churches that we inhabit, and collectively the universal church needs to be seen as the place of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and gentleness. All the things that Paul talked about. We are far from that, obviously, and because all of us are slowed down and all of us realize that cannot meet in communities, we desperately need uh, you know, uh, to physically interact with people, not you know, even though we're so uh, physically distant, we don't have to be socially distant. So how do we manage to bring that together? I see evidences that you know, churches are stepping up um, but we're still not, we don't have the common language, common tongue, to speak about culture at large. So I, I do see this as an opportunity, uh, these kind of dialogues with you, um, with, you know, trying to bring cultural care into, uh, you know, to bring that common tongue is an opportunity. I will build my house where the storm will drown On a rock that does not move I will set my hope in your love, O oh Lord, in your faithfulness will prove you are steadfast, steadfast, you are steadfast. All the starry posts are called out by name each night. In your watchful care, I will rest secure as you leave me with your life. You are steadfast. Stay. Researching this conversation, I saw a lot of similarities between Mako and Scott uh, in their their work and in their attitudes towards art and um, kind of a, a, the, the transcendence of it. And uh, Mako, I was watching your, your um, commencement address from Biola from seven years ago, where you talked about Van Gogh's starring, Starry Night, mm-hmm. and, and, and you say that the, mm-hmm. that, that, that the church has left the building. 
And yes. And I, I made me think of the line that that Scott wrote. Maybe the one line well, I've the ever spirit, uh, spirit tried has to, left the church. The, yeah. the spirit yeah. has left the church, right? And uh, it it just it made me think of the one line that Scott's wrote that I um, challenged him on for many years that the that your life doesn't change by the man who's elected. And I always kind of look at it, and and he's explained. We've talked about this many times, but you know, if you look at it at the surface level. Um, well, yeah, a lot of lives changed. Every time someone different's elected, a lot of lives change for, for better or worse. But, you know, understanding Scott, uh, through the years better, it's this idea of, you know, right now we're in this moment of, of incredible change. Everything's changed, but one thing hasn't changed and that's Jesus Christ. And that's the love of God, which is, is as immense as it's always, same as it ever was, as the Talking Heads line would go. Um, so Scott, you know, to bring you in here, uh, can you talk a little bit about how creating in this time for you, you know, in the midst of so much grieving has, has, uh, has been maybe transcendent, it, it, it kind of transcends the darkness and the suffering we're all experiencing? Yeah. First, I have to say that with uh, Mako, you just, such a good job of speaking um, in a voice that that it's it's a global it's a global perspective that I uh, that I really admire and appreciate because um, I get stumped so I feel the first notion of something like the pandemic and a collective change like is happening I, my first my initial reaction my knee jerk is to go at it globally you know go at it in a big way and and. Uh, Think of it even beyond globally. I think I try. I I, I I yearn to think universally, and I'm always reduced down to what's what's before me. I'm always put back right here hmm. with uh, what I have to work with, and I, I have to accept that. And I go. I return to this this idea of you know generativity um, of okay trust that what you are doing in an intimate setting is is the work that that mm -hmm. God has appointed you to do, that Christ is in it all, and that it is speaking mm -hmm. to what is happening globally, locally, politically, spiritually. Just just trust that, and then just keep listening, listening to God, listening for God, mm -hmm. uh, listening for the Holy Spirit um, in you. Um, and important to me, because Michael and I are both in different points of our lives, but I think in this, both in the second half, uh, that's it. We're both in second half. And, <laughs> and uh, I look yeah. at it and I go, in my, in my interest, from what I, I study spiritually outside of just my own uh, church endeavors, is that every God, Christ is in everything. And I can't go deep until I've treaded in the shallow water. So in this changing time where so many the collective, the collective is, is changing, I go, okay, where do I start? And there's a reset for me to go back to, um, to put it really uh, mechanically, formally, for me, I had not done anything that took a lot of brush strokes in a long time. So I said, I'm going to dig in and do, do a large piece that's going to take a lot of time because I have been, that's one of the gifts in this ad adverse moment. So that's what I did. I turned to the canvas and said, okay, I will. I start swinging my hammer. I'll just swing my hammer. And then from there, the questions will be asked and those answers will be new questions. <laughs> and I'll just keep, I'll keep letting them uh, lead me. That's why I, I can't help but think. And, and Bob knows that I'm, I, uh, there was a, a door open when I got into Leo Tolstoy's late Christian writings, but he wrote a book called, or an essay or a book called what is art. And the very last line he says, uh, Christian art is to establish brotherly union among men. That's the last line of the whole book. And he, he talks about how science and art are inseparable. They're like lungs to the heart. And that, that if science is the, the, the yearning to know for knowledge, that, that art is, is the expression of, of the feeling and knowing, knowing the, the emotions. And uh, they have, the art is, is completely, uh, um, it, it's, it's, so necessary and crucial and critical in that way. And if science is off, art will, will tend to, to follow, will, will bounce. And it's really, it's not that complex, but it can get complex in, in, in speaking about it. But um, I think 
Mako is, is, is commenting on that quite, quite well. Um, culture wars and culture care is a, a perfect way of, of the same things that Thomas Merton said, same things that Richard Rohr say about, look, you know, it's not the, that's not the, it's not the end of the enemy is with, you know, we're, we are all part of that body. And um, as long as we do that, it's just like Mako said, we're reducing our, our claim. When our claim is, is all, it's all the same and it's oneness. And we reduce it into nothing, nothing that looks like that at all. So that's what all that makes me think of. Scott, I had seen and, and heard you uh, talk about your most recent record. Um, and it feels like uh, you and, and the band are doing, um, have really shifted your your voice in some ways on this record. And, and I would just be curious if you would talk, uh, because uh, how Mako is, is talking about culture care to me, against ideas of like the binaries of culture wars is, you know, much more of an exercise of discernment. And, and, and that's what the artist does, you know, uh, is discerns how much of this to put in and how much to practice restraint. And so it seems like y'all have discerned in this season um, in, some, in some ways to speak up more forcefully or, or um, pointedly. What, what's going on with that or where did, where did that come from for you? Um, I'll say that I heard someone this week say they were given a list of important aspects to some questions that we, we were studying uh, questions in the Bible. And uh, that this is new to me. Studying the Bible, like really studying the Bible is pretty new for me. But uh, in one of those, the list of important things was uh, to pray honestly. And when, when she said that, I said, okay, well, that covers everything. Um, <laughs> what I've recognized in our, our looking back, removing myself from what we make musically, and I'll say this about vis visual as well, uh, the narrative of it, as well as the act of it, I can't help but view it all as prayer. In some way, it's all, it's all a type of prayer. And what, one thing that happened along the way for us in the, in the band, Bob would remember this, we were sort of pushed on a, 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 polit a bill that was in North Carolina that we were kind of pushed to speak out about it. And we were going to write uh, a statement about it. And just short of releasing the statement, we, we stopped and said, wait a second, we are not, we are not politicians. We, we, we don't write political statements and, and release them. What do we do? We make, we create based on what we honestly, sincerely experience. That's, that's our contribution. That is, that is what we would have to think God, um, how God works through us. We have to trust that. Um, so what we did was turn to our craft and, uh, and I, you know, you said it forcefully, I hope it wasn't forcefully because the idea is to relinquish, release, whatever, really get into the harmony and the flow of things versus being, being forceful with anything. So what we try to do is open more doors instead of, uh, uh, close pathways and, and, um, uh, make a narrow way. By force, I don't, you know, a, a stream has force. It doesn't necessarily mean violence. So, uh, <laughs> absolutely. No, I got you. No, 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 no. I don't mean by, by but I mean, I'm talking about like working something, like not sure. working so hard to, to, to work something into form It's more like, what is the form? Allow yourself to be part of the form, jump on board and, and, you know, follow a little more than, than, than form and lead, uh, follow that that notion so that's yeah yeah i i got you i don't mean any uh any critical uh uh angle there but um so that's i think where personally we had experiences with some with all the things we talk about uh in our in our poetry and our music and in in i really try hard in visual um uh endeavors to just i go i try to go as as close to to my conscious, as close to my spirit as I possibly can. So I'm just saying, be as sincere as possible. And, and you know, that the, the, the cliche is right about what you know. Um, paint what you can see. We can hear creation grown is crying out for God. It I hear creation song and it 
it sings, oh, oh, oh Lord, and we sing. You are light and you are love You are flesh and you are blood Peace will come to the house of love Marco. Maybe we're asking the same question. When you first started talking about culture care, uh, it was in the wake of 9-11 and you were in mm -hmm. New York City. Yeah. Um, it, I've heard and it seems like people are really grasping for an analogy to make for COVID-19. And mm -hmm. uh, I've heard to some extent people um, talk about it in, in the same breath as a tragedy like 9-11. Um, and... I think it's beautiful that you talk about even a tragedy like that being a source and a opportunity for generativity. Um, w what are you seeing and what are you hearing uh, around this time that we're all in as being a, a, a site of creativity? Yeah, first of all, I, I so appreciate what Scott said. And um, I began to do this two years ago, but uh, every month I take one song per month and you see these canvases in the back, uh, 48 by 48. Uh, so I take one of those and I spend a month uh, reflecting on one psalm per month. And, and I realize it's going to take me 14 years to get through 150 psalms, uh, which, which I didn't really think about. Um, but, but then uh, Dr. Ellen Davis at Duke heard about this and she said, uh, well, what translation are you using? And I said, you know, I'm using various translations. She said, well, why don't I translate it for you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, sure, you know. And we began on this, embarked on this journey, which became several conferences and at Duke. And uh, this year, we're going to do it remotely, um, obviously. But, uh, you know, this, I, I, I see this as a kind of an invitation to slow art, you know, to slow ourselves down, to really... Uh, really be uh, honest with ourselves because some some you know doc, dr davis ellen says that psalm is one of the few places in the bible where god takes uh, uh a human authentic honest expressions and not only receives that but turns that into sacred text and that, that's like crazy stuff it's like rap music you know uh, yeah. becoming yeah. a holy text I, which I think I it can, but but it, it really is that kind of um, you know disparity between what we think of um, the, the let's say the purity of the language or whatever, and I I really think that's God's heart is behind this. God is an artist, so therefore God loves honesty and transparency. That, in fact, that's all God is looking for because he, uh, God did everything, you know, that can possibly be done to atone for all of our uh, human failures. And so what are we afraid of? You know, what are we trying to guard? What are we, you know, uh, nothing is safe for the whole family, you know. <laughs> so, so we can be deadly honest and even be angry at God, even say what's on our heart. Why is this happening? Why are my friends dying in the hospitals in New York? Why, you know, and that is what we need, we need to be doing right now. And I don't necessarily think 9-11 uh, and a crisis right now is, you know, perfectly parallel or anything like that. In some ways, that this pandemic is even bigger than 9-11 because it, the whole world is shut down, right? And um, there's something to me, as I agree for people who are um, going through this very difficult time, and people who uh, we had to say goodbye to, as I agree for them, I also think about this incredible opportunity we have because somebody in Bangladesh and somebody in China and myself in Princeton, you know, and all of us are in exactly the same place. 
you know, we have common experience of going through this time. Now we're going to have different cultural parameters. We're going to have different political states, reactions, <clears throat> but universally, uh, somebody in Japan, you know, I was speaking to yesterday that, that, that it's going through a shutdown and isolation, loneliness and depression. That, that is a common experience we can all share. So what kind of art, what kind of music, what kind of, you know, writing, poetry uh, can come out of this time? I, I think there's, uh, you know, we can look up on this time as one of the most important time for the future of uh, culture. Uh, if we are doing uh, diligence and you know cultivating the soil of culture, uh, even though the winter seems to be setting before us, you know. By the way, you know, if you ask any farmer, uh, what is the most important time to prepare the soil for the spring? Uh, that person will say November. <laughs> you know, it's before the winter. You have to set, fix the soil, amend the soil, right? Before all that happens, because a lot of things happen in winter time, underground, we can't see it. And people would be saying, well, there's nothing happening. Well, guess what? There's a lot happening underground. And I believe there's a lot happening underground now. Um, you know, not just among artists, but among people, business folks, you know, education, uh, politics, right? So, so this is this is a way that if you're diligent, and especially for the church to be diligent in cultivating culture beyond our crisis, right? Beyond thinking about the immediacy of this, and of course we have to uh, tend to the poor and tend to the sick. That is our responsibility collectively. Um, but you know, we we need to be futurists. You know, uh, uh, my, my friend Irving McManus <laughs> says Christians are futurists, you know, because we know the future. Uh, good point. <laughs> you know, like, what are we doing now to prepare for the future that we know is coming? You know, how are we speaking into that? How are we uh, creating music for that art? You know, and that's, that's what I think about. I think about the new creation all the time now. I, I, you know, the Christianity it tends to be. Uh, kind of fix it religion, you know, we call it a restoration, but but we really don't fully understand that it's not fixing, it's mending to make new, right? Jesus is still with his wounds. And and so there's a different way of theologically understanding the what we're going through uh, as Christians. We've accepted that God has atoned for our, our sins and we, we can be free. Um, you know, we can be with Jesus at present and the future. But why are we here? <laughs> you know, and we're here be, um, really to create into, uh, take up on this invitation to create into the new creation, uh, to prepare for the banquet to come, to, uh, to be part of the cosmic wedding that is going to take place, that is going to be ushered in at the, you know, at the beginning of new creation. Um, so Christianity is not about this obsession with the end. It's all about the beginnings. And artists are all about the beginnings. And we, we, we are creatures of imagination that, that, you know, that can speak into the new, even, even if we don't think about that. You know, we, a lot of us are just doing it out of uh, sheer discipline and practice. You know, but we, if we can trust our intuition to speak into and invoke the new creation as God allows, you know, we, we can't really explain what we're doing. Uh, songs that's coming out of us, you know, it, it, you know, people ask me all the time, like, can you explain this art? And I'm like, if I can't explain it, I wouldn't have painted it, you know. <laughs> it's, it's just, it just has to be done with the materials that I'm using. It just has to be painted because I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I'm just following the spirit through my intuition and trusting that that's going to produce something new. I can't do that. Only God can do that. So, so I'm like, okay, um, here is something happening in front of me. I have to be honest about this, you know, and maybe it is a discipline of practice to trust the materials, to uh, let the painting speak to me. 
and I'm simply responding like jazz, you know, you have the first note and you have, you know, you respond and I'm improvising with the spirit, uh, with, through my materials, I hear things through my work. And, and so, so I need, I just need to trust it. So, so I, I don't even try to articulate that, but I know that, you know, I have been given also a responsibility and, and a gift to speak for those who can't speak. Uh, many people, poets, artists, uh, are not, you know, not going to be in front of people talking about what the pro- process of what they do. So I, I try to speak for them. Um, I try to advocate, as I said, um, for um, for the arts because it's fundamentally the most important part of us that cannot be marketed, that cannot be put into an industrial model. Uh, it is not scalable in that sense. It, and, and yet it is fundamentally the most important part of what it means to be human, what it means to be a community, and what, you know, because the arts bring people together of, of all sorts of backgrounds. And, and also, it, it just happens to be a conduit in a way that the world uh, has yet to see. And through this pandemic, as I did in 9-11, personally, uh, now university, I think we have that opportunity. Scott, is there something you're working on visually right now that uh, you talked about, you know, working large and these like big brush yeah. strokes? Is there something you that you feel like reflects this it, moment or? It does. No. Yeah. You, well, you've been in the studio, so you saw this. But so, uh, you know, as soon as this thing happens, it's going to speak to everything that Mako just said. Uh, I realized that I was yearning for some type of a sabbatical and that would have probably been put on me by working myself to sickness eventually, <laughs> or, or I don't know, maybe I would come to some sort of understanding and be able to impose it upon myself, but I don't think that I have that, that good sense. But so in the beginning of this, where there was what seemed to be, it doesn't feel this way anymore. Like there's a surplus of time because we're, we've been quickly filled with like, we filled our, our schedules with all kinds of, of things uh, for good and bad. As long as, as long as I stay disciplined about my rest, that's a good thing. But in the beginning, there was, uh, well, I should say, since the pandemic, I spend more time um, open and, and quiet and uh, more like my childhood, there are quieter and, and more solitude and more space to be open and with God. And I can't help but think that during those times, if I take a walk in the woods or if I sit in my living room or if I if I sit at the window, um, during some of those times I, uh, I was walking, I would have these moments, like I'd be opening a junk drawer and I'd be looking at the junk drawer and there'd be a ping pong ball and a, and a uh, an adjustable wrench and a, a charger cable and, and some coins or whatever. And all of a sudden it just feels like everything. You just feel like you're looking at everything in this one little thing. And this happened at, I would look, I was looking at some silverware, and I'm not saying these aren't like, they're not like, they didn't feel like spiritual interventions. They, they're very little moments, but they're very content moments. They're very uh, sacred moments, if you will. So one of these happened when I was just looking at a creek bed. It was, I, I look at this creek all the time, all the time. And, and I got into a habit of, because I'm a figurative painter, or excuse me, I, I would think of myself as a figurative painter, uh, that I paint a figure, right? And uh, Michael, I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, you probably are with, uh, Gustave Courbet's work, you know, so I'm a big fan, but you know, later in his life where he started just painting these wilderness scenes and some of them just get almost like green blob abstract, like, you, you know, they would look like one of your pieces in green, you know, it's just an abstract piece and it's all about the texture and it's all about the applications. It's, it's beautiful. Well, I'm looking down and all of a sudden I'm understanding why he would have gotten to that. I was thinking. I'm good. Okay. This creek bed is, it, it feels like everything in this moment is, is everything because if I am connected to everything and I am here and this is one, it just felt like everything. So I thought, well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm painting next. And so I, you won't see it on the thing obviously, but so I painted, this is the creek image and it's, it's 70 by 90. And so what it was originally, I drew it in pencil. And I drew it only in pencil because I usually don't work that calculated. I go paint straight to canvas. 
But I thought, well, no, I'm going to draw this in pencil. And then I thought, well, this is just going to be a pencil drawing on canvas. And I said, wait a second, you're just, you're trying to avoid color. You're trying to avoid, because color is terrifying, which leads me to another thing you were just saying, Mako. But um, so I said, okay, I'll paint it. I have to paint it. So this thing took a lot of brush strokes for me and a lot of hours. It's, the whole thing took about 80 hours um, all told. I usually work with a bigger stroke than that. So now I'm doing this and I'm usually much bigger, bolder stroke. And it's different than every painting I ever started. They're always different. But what collectively the pandemic is, metaphorically and, and in parallels to a painting or any creative endeavor is entering a dark journey. There's a dark journey that I go into and I don't know. I don't have, I don't know if I have the bread beyond. I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know if I mean, okay, I, maybe I'm a figure painter. Can I paint a leaf? I don't know. But every single time, one of the beautiful things about painting in particular is that you go into this dark journey where even if you've got the formula down where you've painted this a lot of times, there's this breath you have to take before you take that first, that first move, make that first move. And it, the stakes aren't as high as human lives in it. There's no way. It can never be compared. However, it's a dark journey. Metaphorically, there's so much to, to learn within it. Um, in the actual making of it and in the time spent, in the windows of time spent that I make a work, I associate all that with it and it's all in there. Uh, the, the, the audio books I listen to, the essays, the songs, whatever, the things that are happening in current affairs during the painting, all that stuff wraps up. Marco, I know you understand that. They're all built in it. They're all on that canvas. And uh, if anybody else, no one else knows that but me, well, Obviously, God and I know that, and that's that's enough. I have to trust that's enough. Just like that, it's kind of the second chapter in that dark journey, which is the question of why are you doing this? Why are you making this? Because <laughs> if you're making it to move it to sell it, it's dead in the water. And if you can get over that and past that, then you go why, why? And you don't know. It's just like Marco said. We just have a discipline to do it, and a, and a commitment to do it. And I am guided to do it. Um, so that piece has taken up quite a bit of my time. And other than that, I, uh, I did work after that on a piece that is very different. I don't mean to be doing so much show and tell, but it's a triptych. <laughs> and it's this right here. We'll have to get some of these to include in the show notes. <laughs> Whatever. I just, uh, for, I just want to. For, wanna... our, for yeah. our audio podcast <laughs> listeners. Well, yeah, this is wonderful. Yeah, it's just easy to explain, like the difference. And just and to, to speak again to what Mark and I are saying, is to try to be sincere in... You know, I get moved by something, you feel it, you see it, and you just say, okay, trust yourself, have this one to make it. If it's taking up space, too bad, you have to do it. Just just do it. I got peace like a river, I got peace like a river, I got peace like a river in my soul. I got peace like a river, I got peace like a river, I got peace like a river in my soul. I got joy like a fountain, I got joy like a fountain, I got joy like a fountain in my soul. I got joy like a fountain, I got joy like a fountain, I got joy like a fountain in my soul. Singing on low. It's really striking to me, even just on this, where we're doing this call via Zoom, so we get to see into your studios a little. And I've been doing, I'm a pastor, and I've been doing church on Zoom for the last two months. And I hate it, but I also love the intimacy of being able to look into people's homes uh, as we worship together. But um, I'm drawn to some of the parallels between you all. First, um, the work that you each are doing is is pretty different from each other, but it, it's both uh, largely originating on a farm. Uh, you guys create on a farm, each of you, um, many miles away. <laughs> um, and and the, the, the other thing uh, that I notice is each of you, especially Scott with your music, are schooled in really traditionalist media and in some ways are, are doing something really new and something personal and something emotive, um, maybe above and beyond, you know, what Americana bluegrass music does. And, and that, and your audience knows that and feels that and intuits that, uh, Mako, you are 
uh, taking on this, this, you know, tradition, this Japanese traditional uh, style of painting that involves pulverized precious metals. And, and you're doing something firmly within that, but above and beyond it. I, I'd love for you to kind of to both talk a, about um, doing that and the challenges of that, where you feel uncomfortable doing that. Yeah, so uh, for, first, I, I, I want to just respond to Scott's new works. I, uh, you know, whenever somebody takes that leap, you know, you can always tell as an artist, um, you, you're always um, so grateful <laughs> because, because, you know, you're like, I, I know how hard that is, you know, is it's to, to say, you know, let's say you, you, you have a successful mode of expressing and, and, and then you say, uh, you know what, you know, I'm seeing something different and I'm just going to go with it and I'm going to take that leap and go into that darkness and unknown mystery and I, I just, I, I just want to applaud you because the, the works that I could see, um, you know, I, I, I hope to be able to visit right. at some point. Right. But you know, that it indicates something that is not only authentic, but but to me is very new. Um, you know, it, work that only you can do, work that, and and I love the variation that you're experimenting with because that. Uh, you know, that also is fascinating to me. And it's part of the, our culture right now is to be able to push ourselves in different directions. You know, you with your music and, and now with visual, but it's really, you know, same kind of area of investigation, right? And, and experimentation, trying something new. And, you know, you, you, you obviously have the facility to coalesce that into into something that, that communicates well and and so you know i i am so grateful to even take a peek oh, at yes, that same. creativity you know thank and you. it's it's just it's just awesome to me it's so exciting to me to see that thank you, um, yeah and second of all i think you know what we're in a, in a strange way like we don't even know each other but we're endeavoring into the same zone same territory of culture and we don't know what that is we don't even know how to express that but but we're journeying into something and um it's important that we kind of begin to uh, be aware of something that's happening that that is not part of the reductivism of the you know the reality of commerce like you said um reality of politics, let's say, in, in a smaller sense, you know, there, there's a larger sense of all of us being political in, in a sense we care for the world, but in a smaller sense of what's happening in media, it, it's just so disjointed and so dehumanizing. We, we you know, we both of us are like in, in our farms, you know, like <laughs> leave us alone, you know, we like self isolation, you know. <laughs> and but and, and but the Holy Spirit, right, takes us into a place where we, we, we don't even know where we're going, but you know, we're just trusting our intuition to you know journey into that and we find out that so many others all over the world <laughs> are kind of navigating into that space. And it, it's so amazing to me, right, how God works. And uh, it could be a transsexual artist in Bangladesh. And, and we see it and we say, we recognize it. We see the fingerprint of God in that work. Absolutely. And this this has always happened to me in West Village, and you know, in 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 nineties, I would go into these studios of artists and you know have coffee with them, and what they're seeing saying to me, even though they're so alienated from the church, <laughs> is more, let's say, you know, closer to the spirit pattern, you know, Act Seventeen of the Unknown Gods that Paul talks about, you know, Unknown God. I, I mean that and that that passage um, of the new revelation speaking through culture, right, and through uh, gay bars in West Village, you know, <laughs> and 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 I'm like, well, how could this be? You know, the church is supposed to be the harbinger of that voice, but we don't hear that voice in the church. We have to be very still and listen through 
right? To, um, you know, sit in the back, wear black, and <laughs> just, you know, try to listen through to the spirit. And I'm talking to these artists who are, you know, so angry at God, and, and, but they seem to be tapped into something that, that is so relevant to me, at least. And, and that's the sense I get from your work, that you're, you're really looking into things and, and you, you have the capacity to, you know, hold things together, which is, which is a very rare gift. And, and so I, I, I really appreciate Thank you, Marco. Uh, just Thank you. Into that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what was the question? <laughs> I forget. Uh, well, the, you, you're doing great. You can go wherever okay. you want to go. But, <laughs> okay. but, but uh, I'm particularly interested in the ways that you, you all inhabit old mediums and, oh, and explode yeah. out of them or, or move yeah. through them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to me, tradition is, you know, if people think of tradition as something that's old and, you know, like already determined. Uh, to me, tradition is always being made new. Right. So you take something of the past and, and this is the modernist era. You know, there, there's a black hole, you know, where they say, well, we're going to get rid of the tradition, you know, and we're going to create something new. Well, you can't really do that. You know, I mean, just it's just impossible to do that anyway. They, they tried and we've seen like Mark Rothko trying and, you know, he's like reverting back to Jewish mysticism, you know, of, of, of the, uh, you know, his, his childhood uh, growing up in Russia. And, and it's just, it's just like you can't get away from tradition. Uh, there, but there is something that, you know, if you are honest about it, uh, that has formed you, it's in your DNA, and you trace that path. And, and you get to a place where you encounter something, whether it be materials, method, or stories that you realize you're connected with and you're made for this and yet your responsibility is to make new. So I, I always speak of tradition that way that it's being made new, you know, and I'm, I'm actually keeping the tradition alive by doing something radically transgressive <laughs> to what people think the tradition is. Uh, so I stay away from kind of the salon thinking, you know, of, of, okay, so let's keep the tradition by painting in the same way or, uh, you know, just marketing it, which is actually easier to market. You can make a lot of money doing this, but I, I, I to me, that's not interesting at all. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, so what, you know, the materiality of what I do with pulverized minerals and gold and, and hundred year old ink, you know, how can we bring that into the new? Um, because I believe that God loves materials, you know, loves earth, loves the stuff that comes out of the earth and, and whatever is extravagant and um, gratuitous, uh, it's part of the gospel narrative, right? Uh, you know, Mary pouring her nard, expensive nard, onto anoint Jesus. That I'm trying to be like Mary. You know, I'm trying to just just be wasteful for the sake of God. You know, and 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 like saving up to these very expensive materials because I care about materials. I want the best. You know, I don't. I don't, you know, I mean, there's no reason why you can't use masking tape to make art or cardboard. But, but you know, to me, the, my journey has been, my connection, my DNA has led me to uh, these materials. So that's, that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. I have several questions, but I think we need to, you know, for, first of all, I, I want everybody to watch the video of Mako talking about oyster shell white on YouTube. And it's uh, shortly after, I guess, the COVID quarantine begins. And it's just a beautiful message. Made me think of Scott a lot. There's so many connections between the two of you. And even in the formative years of your lives, like in Mako's book, you talk about the very beginning, you taught special needs children. And then you painted and your wife was going through grad school and made me think of Scott when you lived in Mars Hill and Sarah would just begin her nursing career. And I want to ask you about that formative time for each of you, but if I'm down to my last question, I, we need to take it back to culture care. And we are in a time of darkness, 
And something I wrestle with, and I think I ask it because I think many people wrestle with it, is we see injustice all around us. We see it on the news. We see something and we're like, that is, that is crazy. How could they say that? How could they believe that? How could he feel that way? How could these people follow him because he says these things? And, you know, uh, I heard at church, a uh, great Zoom church a couple weeks ago where the pastor said, we need to see those we disagree with as Jesus sees them, as God sees them. And that changes everything. And so like the lyric um, that Scott wrote, it's the idea of transcending the moment. Richard War talks about the masks, the Republican and Democrat, just masks, people wearing masks. Um, how do we as you say, Mako, protect the earth, uh, defend what is right, but also do it in a transcendent way uh, where we're not in the mud. And we're, we're, we're seeing even, you know, even though we believe we have the righteous, we believe what's right, maybe in our righteousness, we're wrong. And um, I'd like each of you to kind of respond to that. Um, and what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I can. I mean, I can say my part, so Marco can can uh, finish this thing right. You know, I, I, I let me try to tie this in. In my own psychological work, there's the enemy within that I have, the disagree, the the disagreeable part of me. It's it's a you know the the concept of this little me that um, his feelings are hurt all the time. He's envious. He he wants he wants everything and wants everybody else to have nothing. Uh, and he does that to the other part of me that is uh, is very much in dis- disagreement of that. I can't hate that part of me. I have to I have to disagree with that part of me in a loving way. So to me, if I start there, and if I can achieve that first, and go, okay, I hear you. You're jealous. You're you're little. You're hurt, but you're loved. You just can't drive. You just can't drive the car. You got it. You got to, you're going to have to, you're going to have to be held accountable for what you do. You're going to have to be watched and you have to, you have to sit over there. Uh, and over time, the smaller and smaller, I, I hope it will get until I can pass through. Um, when I look at other people, if I view other people the same way, then there's nothing wrong with calling for lack of a better term, calling wrong, wrong. You know, when someone does something that's not compassionate, that is, is, is downright hateful, uh, they have to be held accountable. However, God would have us love them so they can be held accountable in a loving way and they can be disagreed with in a loving way. They can be dealt with in a loving way. Um, that's a mystery to me. I don't, I don't have any answer to that, but I have that within myself when I'm dealing with someone that I just downright disagree with. I have to go, can I do this in the most loving way possible? And, uh, my goal is to, as I, as I continue this journey and get older and become, uh, if I'm lucky enough to be an elder at that point, I'll be able to control this in the hardest times, you know, in the, in those moments when I'm like, Oh boy, I've really been done wrong. And I've got to let the world know and I got to let them know and I got to get them back. But hopefully in that time I can, you know, I can, I can do this and to my core, you know, be, be mostly that, be mostly that, as much that as I possibly can be. I think if I look at the culture and the, and the population in bigger terms in that way, then, um, then I just feel like I'm at least directed the right way. So, I, you know, I don't, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, stra- strangely enough, that that doesn't sound all that different than standing in that riverbed and seeing the whole world, you know? Um, it's got to be the same sta- thing. It's got to be the same thing. Yeah, it's yeah be. standing with, with yourself and being critical yet patient with yourself um, in order to, you know, experience as a microcosm, the, the macrocosm of this world. Yeah. Must be. Yeah, thank, thanks, guys, uh, for inviting me into this uh, conversation. And, uh, you know, past four years has been the darkest years of my life. And um, uh, since you mentioned my wife, who, you know, started in some ways this culture care journey, um, you know, she left the marriage four years ago, um, and uh, my parents passed away soon after. So so I, I've been through this 
heck of a journey. And my wife's uh, leaving the marriage had uh, apparently had something to do with uh, trauma, but uh, uh, I'm sure there's you know part that I own to to that. And uh, so I you know I had to go through this period of reflection and deep you know deep ways of searching my heart. And you know, and and so when the COVID uh, pandemic happened, um, you know, I was just coming out of that, and I I felt like now I look back on the, those dark days and see that as a gift. I can I can choose, truly be thankful for 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 those experiences. Uh, I don't know how that can be. Um, you know how how could you be hold with gratitude and with joy, things that you don't want uh, even now to have happened. And so uh, I've been thinking a lot about this. And part of my journey, uh, as you may know, is uh, through the venerable tradition of Kintsugi. Uh, Kintsugi is the uh, tea master uh, holding on to the fractured bowls and mending it with gold and, and to restore it. I have one here that my friend did. Um, and so, so you're not hiding the fracture, but you're making a new design out of it with gold. So, um, I always say when we do Kintsugi workshops, you know, you're not fixing your, you know, your trauma or whatever you're mending to make new. Um, and it, the, this is going to be more valuable than the original. So that to me is new creation. And that, that to me is uh, what God is doing in my life. And uh, the, you know, what, uh, so, so we launched a thing called Acad uh, Kintsugi Academy, and we're going to do some public things uh, this fall, you know, small gatherings, but, uh, and initially began with remote, um, you know, ways of practicing Kintsugi. We've developed this kit that anybody can do, even children can do it uh, in an authentic Japanese way. So, um, you know, to for them to experience a little bit of Nihonga that way, a little bit of cultural care that way, and uh, this is a practical way to do that. But uh, but it's basically coming out of darkness, coming out of fracture, coming, you know, that, like looking at myself honestly and saying, well, you, you know, God's grace, uh, is not limited to the situation. So what what, what can you uh, respond to? And uh, Kintsugi has certainly been one of the most important metaphors. And, you know, I feel like when, I, when I'm speaking with artists, I don't have to explain this. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it, it's in there. It's, there. it's in their music. It's their art, you know, like, so it, it, it's oftentimes I have to explain this to Christians, unfortunately. Um, you know, who has a certain stance toward um, even 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 talking about you know we should be as Jesus to those who disagree with you. You know, to me that that's fine, and and we should attempt to do that. But that's like not understanding <laughs> that our commonality with them, like like we are the enemy. Like, you know, the people we disagree with, probably we disagree with because there's something in us that we don't want to be, right? And we see that in ourselves, so we're scared of it. And so we, we, we set this, um, you know, figurehead or, you know, scapegoat and project that onto another person. And that I do that. I realize that in, in these four years, I, how much I do that. And I don't want to do that. So, like what Scott, uh, you know, what um, Scott was saying, it, it, this is, uh, I mean, I, I just have to be, all I can be is completely devastatingly honest about myself <laughs> and, and to not to project anything other than who I am, you know, as, as fractured and broken as I am, that God has poured his gold into me. And that's why I can be thankful. That, that's why I can move forward. That's why I can create these new works. And, and that, you know, and that, that's all I need to do. I don't have to pretend like, you know, I'm, a, I'm an elder of it, you know, <laughs> but, which, which I am. But, you know, it's, <laughs> that's not important at all. It's, it's really about um, being authentic and, and, and being able to uh, hear the spirit in, in that state. Mako Fujimura, Scott Avett, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Great.
spent more than an hour of your day listening to this conversation and for that we're grateful we'd love to continue the conversation by social media so you can contact us at bob crawford base at rev brez or through the show's social media at rtn theology we'd love to hear the ways that you're experiencing these conversations the ways that you're sharing them and sparking new conversations the ways that you're building community and any ideas you might have for future guests or topics If you enjoyed today's episode, you might want to dig back through the catalog of previous episodes. They're all good, but you might be particularly interested in RTN Theology number 5 with Jeremy Begbie on a conversation about theology and the arts, or maybe RTN 13 from last year with Dr. Jennifer Allen Craft about the arts and place, or maybe RTN Theology 16 with Isaac and Megan Wardell about their experience creating community worship music through the Porter's Gate Project. We'll link to all these in the show notes, and you can listen again or experience for the first time and share with others. As always, RTN Theology is edited by the wonderful Gary Fletcher, hosted and produced by Bob Crawford and Chris Breslin. Special music for this episode generously comes to us from Josh Garrell's new album, Peace to All Who Enter Here. This album released a couple weeks ago, and it was made during this time of quarantine in his home studio, but he also shared with his community of friends from afar as they contributed to this album of covers and originals. Uh, The whole vibe of this captures the hope and generativity that we all need in this time. Go to his Bandcamp. You can download it at a name-your-own-price rate. You can also stream it on Spotify. Our intro music is A.A. Gray and Seven Foot Dilly. The old arcs are moving. And we love to end our show with David Childers' Jesus Said. Please remember to rate us on iTunes and write a review. Subscribe to our podcast. And please, please, please share this episode with a friend. Until next time, take care.